Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar. I am Elisa Baum, and I am Gridgain Systems Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a moment, but first I'd like to conduct a bit of housekeeping. Could you please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know if you can hear me? And let's see here. Can you hear me, audience? Yes, you can. Thank you so much. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. But should you have any questions during the discussion, please go ahead and enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the presentation, we'll take time to answer as many questions as possible. And those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog entry on GridGain's blog. In addition, a recording of this webinar and slides will be made available to everyone within 48 hours. So with that said, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, Financial Regulatory Compliance, a deep dive into navigating the ever-changing landscape. It's being presented by Grid Gain Systems Senior Solution Architect, Fodi Philokoros. And with that said, I will turn the floor over to Fodi. Go ahead, Fodi. All right, thank you, Elisa. And uh, just confirm for me one second, Lisa, that you can hear me all right before we get started. You sound great. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, you know, a little background about myself. Again, as, as Lisa mentioned, I'm Fodis Filicoros. I'm a senior solutions architect uh, working specifically in financial services. I've been working in financial services for the better part of my career, uh, but I also have a large background in compliance. Um, now, what I will say is that I'm by no means a compliance expert, right? But I've, I've faced a lot of the, um, the the regulatory discussions that have been going on, you know, over the course of the past, uh, let's say eight years or so, right? So uh, without much further ado, we're gonna hop into this and just kind of take a look at the agenda that we have for today. Okay, so initially when we walk through this presentation, we're gonna talk about um, you know, the general economic outlook, just kind of getting a feel for where we are globally in terms of economics. Uh, my, my background is in economics as well um, as uh, informational systems and, and IT infrastructure, but um, it's always nice to set a baseline before we actually hop into discussing the different regulatory uh, financial compliance guidelines that kind of shape a lot of um, the, the activity of big banks nowadays. Uh, once we set that baseline and kind of talk about some of the banking industry challenges, we'll discuss the current landscape. Now, there are tons and tons of regs, right? Uh, I, th I think we all know that uh, regula regulations, uh, specifically with Dodd-Frank, I mean, there's, there's thousands of revisions per year. Um, you know, we're going to be taking kind of an eagle eye view on some of the main ones here that I've highlighted, uh, which are, you know, the Basel Committee uh, guidelines, which are some international guidelines. We'll talk about Dodd-Frank and the Volcker Rule a bit, um, CCAR, and, uh, and finally the, the newer Financial Choice Act that just passed the House of Representatives uh, in June, uh, which is exciting. Uh, once we kind of talk about the landscape and, and, and kind of the state of where financial regs uh, kind of have been and where they're going, uh, we'll talk about some of the key technological trends that uh, organizations are facing now um, and, uh, you know, what we really see in the marketplace. Uh, and then we'll take a, a quick look at a use case of um, how uh, some financial compliance is done from an architectural standpoint. Um, and then we'll talk about how that use case can kind of be augmented or streamlined utilizing in-memory grid computing. Um, and then we'll, we'll answer your questions, all right? So I'll do my best to, to give everyone enough time. Just please uh, type your questions in the chat and uh, without further ado, we'll get started. Just to set some baseline expectations, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I spent a number of years in consulting and regulatory and compliance. Um, the better part of my career in financial services. Uh, for for the, the purpose of this talk, we're going to focus mostly on U.S. related uh, regulations and economy uh, and economic conditions, uh, but we will talk about some of the, um, you know, the, the Basel uh, international uh, regs that actually affect the U.S., as well as uh, kind of taking a look at a, a use case from, from one of the, uh, the European Union's uh, banking architects. Um, 
I'll also preface this discussion by saying that this is not aimed to be political or, or politically slanted in any way, um, but it would be foolish to not uh, realize how the state of our political um, culture here in the US kind of drives a lot of these financial regs. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at some of the use cases I mentioned. And if you see any data or any charts that are out there, they'll all be referenced in the slide. All right. So first off, let's take a look at our economic outlook. Um, so as you can see here, taking a look at world GDP growth, again, if you don't know what GDP is, it's the gross domestic product, uh, which is essentially the calculation of overall economic output um, by each country. We're looking at it from a macro level here of what the world has done. I mean, as you can see, we haven't had over 4% growth in GDP um, since the mid 80s. Uh, you know, then the slowdown of the growth can be attributed to the size of the total world market. I mean, things have, uh, you know, grown exponentially. Um, GDPs have grown, uh, economies have grown across the world. The total rate of growth is obviously going to be more difficult to achieve at these uh, higher values, right? Um, but, you know, you still can attribute some of it to the, the lagging behind of some emerging markets out there. Um, I think what we what you can see here, this chart is up to uh, 2016, uh, and this was taken from the World Bank. Uh, this this uh, this this graph here, um, but you can see, you know, last year there was some slight economic uh, growth after uh, after low in, low inflation and low interest rates uh, across the world. Um, you know, we're just coming out of one of the slowest economic recoveries in recorded history, um, and we'll talk about kind of. Uh, you know, what the economic outlook is moving forward for 2017 and, and what we expect to see in the future. So you can see here, uh, U.S. Uh, GDP growth will rise to, you know, 2.2%. 2, 2 and, you know, that is, again, real GDP, um, which is a, a different metric of, of what uh, standard GDP is. Um, it's slightly better than previous years. Uh, last year we had 2.1% growth in 2016, uh, weaker than in 2015 where the, the economy was really uh, coming out of the recession and you were seeing increased, uh, increased jobs uh, in the market. Uh, you know, they're, they're projecting a drop from 2.1% uh, potentially in 2018 and 1.9% in 2019. Again, this, this data comes from IHS market, which is oddly enough, uh, one of our uh, customers here at GridGain. Um, so, you know, you can see that, um, you know, typically what they state is anywhere between two and 3% is actually healthy growth for GDP. Um, the Bureau for Labor Statistics uh, expects total employment to increase this year from 20, uh, uh, by 20 and a half million jobs between 2010 and 2020. Um, so, you know, there is, there is some positive um, things to look forward to. Um, but I, I, you know, I have a quote here from the Federal Reserve Chair, Janet Yellen. Um, and, you know, she can attribute a lot of these numbers currently um, to part-time workers that would prefer to be full-time. Um, so, so most job growth currently is attributed in low paying retail and food service industries, especially here in the U.S. Um, and some people that have had skilled positions have been out of work for so long, been out of the workforce that they won't have the opportunity to return to their high paying jobs. Um, so, so there's, there's a good reason or a, a good excuse to, to, to be bullish on uh, the market moving forward in the next couple of years. Um, but there are also some drawbacks. So, you know, many economists and well-known global financial experts uh, expect uh, some of the following things to occur. Um, and, and this is kind of for the, for the current state of things. So, you know, the, the first thing that I want to highlight is, um, you know, we, we expect the U.S. economy to accelerate in 2017. Um, you know, again, you know, with, with uh, the new uh, presidential change here in the U.S., um, they're expecting tax cuts and infrastructure spending. And they're expecting, uh, you know, growth to pick up to 2.6% in 2018. 
um, consumer and business confidence rebounded initially after the election, and it was some of the highest uh, trading uh, uh, it, uh, growth for the for the S and P and a lot of the markets that you see here. Um, we're also expecting European economic momentum to slow a little bit, and again, this is primarily uh, driven by uh, Brexit and a lot of political uncertainties that are going on with the EU and with Britain currently. Um, so that instability in the market is kind of causing some economists to expect downfall and downturn. Again, we can see and we can attribute a lot of uh, economic faith uh, driven by political process and the stability of, uh, of, of specific uh, uh, world powers, in this case, the US and, and, and England and, and, and the European Union. Um, another last thing I kind of want to note is that interest rates will be raising, will be rising and they'll continue to rise. So, uh, you know, we expect the federal reserve to raise interest rates at least three times in 2017, and we'll see what that effect will have, uh, on the lending market and on a lot of our, uh, you know, our the, the core focus of our discussion today, which is, uh, the big banks out there. Okay, so let's, you know, let's talk about the elephant in the room, which again is, is policy, right? So again, this talk isn't, isn't driven to be political in nature, uh, but again, a lot of policy drives financial regulation. Um, you know, a, a, a quick rundown of the, of the banking collapse in 2008, um, you know, was, uh, you know, you had banks out there that were making risky investments with uh, you know, not their own equity at stake. Um, they weren't able to, uh, to cover a lot of their, their bets that they had out there in the markets. Um, they weren't able to, uh, to cover, you know, withdrawals and all the different equity positions and things of that nature. And there was a default, a major default. I think we all felt it. It was the start of a major crisis, uh, worldwide, um, on, in, in terms of, um, you know, kind of a recession that happened. So again, what was done in response to this was the increase of regulations. Thus, you see Dodd-Frank um, and, the, and the Basel uh, rules that were kind of proposed even before the banking collapse, but with the urgency of the current state of things were, uh, were passed to completion a lot quicker. Um, so what does this mean for organizations? Well, this means that uh, any anyone that was out of compliance with these these different regs were left with heavy fines and litigation related expenses, right? Um, so you know, recent election results now have have caused kind of a change in in party powers, especially here in the U.S. Um, and then what you tend to find is that policy will shift, right? So not only the case. Uh, it's, it's not only, always the case, but, you know, the, the Democratic parties tend to regulate the market while the Republican parties uh, here in the U.S. tend to deregulate. Um, so what does that mean for us? That leaves financial compliance in a constant state of flux. Uh, just a little anecdote about myself, but I was working for a trading software firm during the 2008 crisis. Um, and when Dodd-Frank was implemented, uh, it left organizations scrambling to get in line with, uh, you know, a lot of the new compliance guidelines, especially the ethical compliance guidelines, um, and you know, a lot of the stress testing that need needed to be done. Uh, you know, fast forward now eight years uh, since then, or it's nine years now, um, and we have a you know a, a new provision now that just passed the House that is rolling back a lot of these Dodd Frank related policies, right? Uh, so you know. In light of, in light of that news, there is there's oh, jumped ahead. In light of that news, there's that juxtaposition that goes on, um, and um, you know we 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 recently still have an, an Obama uh, appointed regulator um, who was the head of the uh, CFPB, and uh, he essentially came out and had a new ruling today, or it was actually yesterday, um, on the use of arbitration to resolve disputes. So now um, there's quite a bit of flux in how policy is, is moving and how it's going to shake out as the new uh, 
you know, administration comes in and the previous administration's um, policies are kind of rolled out. But I think the point is, uh, you know, that we're, we're expecting a constant ebb, ebb and flow of how policies are enacted or removed. Um, this has gone on even pre-Obama into the Bush administration. Um, and you, you tend to see that globally as well as different, uh, you know, political organizations come in. Um, policy will change. I mean, that happened recently with uh, with Greece as well and the crisis there. And, um, you know, we, we, we can expect to see it moving forward. Um, so so what's the, the banking industry, um, you know, the, the post-2008 re, uh, reality? Um, banks have earned over a trillion dollars in profits since the crisis, right? So it's certainly not an industry that's hurting, um, but you know, the price to play now is certainly a lot higher. Um, so, you know, I have a quote here from the Boston Consulting Group, um, but they thought, you know, found that financial institutions have paid combined $321 billion since the crisis in fines and penalties. You have organizations like FINRA that are popping up now that have, um, uh, you know, or all these different watchdog um you know, non-governmental private organizations that are monitored by the SEC that are out there to ensure, um, you know, faith in the market, to ensure that financial organizations aren't, um, you know, stepping over the line according to the regs. Um, and, and, a, and a lot of folks have paid heavy, heavy fines for it, uh, have paid, uh, uh, you know, dearly. Um, so, you know, what's the consensus? Um, you know, it seems to be that Policy will be here to stay. Dodd Frank will be here to stay. Yeah, it requires a majority um, vote in the Senate to pass, uh, which is 60 votes out of 100. Uh, currently, that doesn't look like it'll be the case, uh, but it looks like what will happen, uh, at least for now, and at least the outlook moving forward, is that regs will be rolled back as much as they can. Um, so, um, I have a, a, a quote here from um, from uh, from a gentleman who works for the CFPB. Uh, you know, he claims that he thinks Dodd Frank is going to stay in its broad architecture, and the interpretation of Dodd Frank by regulators um, that may see a different approach from how the Trump administration is moving in to the previous administration. Um, so, so, so the good thing, and, and a lot of the criticisms that you'll hear about these regs is that they have been left open for interpretation on how to actually be implemented, right? So there may be some easing up in the markets, but we certainly don't see them going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, what's the other important thing to notice is that ROE, so return on equity, is the lowest it's been in the last 20 years, right? So it's below 10%. Uh, that's projected for 2015 and 2017. So let's let's take a look at that in a little bit further detail here. So again, as I mentioned here, you can see a a a, a graph here um, uh, by Roland Berger, uh, is a top economist. He's taking a look at uh, a return on equity below 10%. As you can see, uh, you know the highest it was uh, pre. <laughs> financial collapse, right? 2006, you can see it was above 20%. Uh, ever since the financial crisis and regs were implemented, ROE has diminished. Uh, now, there, there's a lot of conjecture on why that is the case. Um, you know, a lot of uh, people from the banking uh, world believe that it's because um, they don't have the freedom now to take the same positions, to take the same, um, you know, free market liberties that they would in the past. Um, a lot of folks now are saying that uh, that's the price to pay for stability, right? Um, so, uh, you know, in response to a lot of these pressures, what are we seeing? We're seeing big banks out there that are cutting costs, they're restructuring, um, and they're optimizing certain business lines by selling their non-core assets and exiting less profitable activities. So a lot of these swaps and, uh, and, 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 and uh, more complicated instruments out there that were previously being sold, now have um, different committees like FINRA, for example, that are monitoring them, and they have to be done kind of in the light of day. 
a lot of banks don't want to uh, participate in those types of high risk uh, uh, instruments anymore and thus we can potentially see a drop in their ROE. Um, so what does that lead to us? That leads to us uh, one, one, one of the major drivers for regulatory uh, technological performance um, and that seems to be fines and litigation, right? So let's talk about the cost of playing the game, right? So um, the, the Government Accountability Office, um, they originally estimated Dodd-Frank compliance for all banks. Uh, and that, again, that's, that's U.S. banks or banks that operate uh, in the U.S. market at roughly $2.9 billion for the first five years. Now, there are other folks out there that think, um, that a lot of these numbers that you'll see from a lot of these organizations are, are, are dubious. Um, you know, there are often examples of rules costing $105 billion or $200 billion to implement. Um, they actually estimated um, the Affordable Care Act rule that would require 1.9 trillion hours uh, in paperwork um, to, 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 uh, to achieve. Um, but once they've actually done the calculations, they they realize that that was much lower in the billions, and that simple calculations were were done incorrectly. So, I mean, a, a lot of these numbers leave you a little uh, skeptical, I guess, of what the the, the complete uh, impact is. Um, but uh, you know, the 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 cost of compliance itself is is definitely imminent. Um, you definitely have an increased uh, number of folks that had to 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 work and 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 uh, overtake different types of uh, activities now within the banks that they previously wouldn't have to do in the past, right? So I mean, it's you're seeing similar types of things. If you see the quote here by Adam Posen, um, who's the you know the president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, you know he's essentially saying the same thing. You got an enormous share of the financial sector workforce engaging in things that non-banking business complained about after Sarbanes-Oxley. And again, Sarbanes-Oxley is a, uh, one of the, the previous regs passed in the early 2000s, right? Um, so, you know, what's the key takeaway here? The key takeaway is um, that there is an associated cost to compliance. There is an associated cost to um, the litigation. Um, even from a technological perspective, you have folks that are coming on board, you have new software that you have to kind of, um, you know, build into budgets now to kind of tackle a lot of these compliance initiatives. And the reason for that being is it's, it's basic economic principle. Um, the less we have to spend on litigation and the less we have to spend on fines, the better off we're going to be uh, economically. Uh, and you take that sunk, sunk cost from a lot of these other um, perspectives. So, um, you know, what we do know about all this is that it's causing the banks certainly to react. Um, so, you know, how are banks reacting? You know, they're building better controls to uh, to avoid this this burden of litigation uh, and and fines. You know, they're implementing you know know your know your customer related. Uh, policies, um, which, you know, refers to kind of the due diligence, due diligence activities that financial institutions and other regulated companies must perform, uh, as well as kind of AML policies or anti-money laundering. Uh, no longer can, can banks kind of take a blind eye um, to a lot of the lending policies that they had in the past. Things are a lot stricter now. Um, you know, things that are of particular interest to me are the real-time trade compliance, surveillance, and monitoring, right? Because that's something that specifically kind of bleeds into the world of technology a lot more, uh, specifically with a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, monitoring and, and, and uh, performance softwares that are out there in the market now. Um, but, um, you know, companies are investing a ton and ton of money. And when I say companies, I mean the big banks in kind of uh, mitigating this litigation burden that they do have. All right. So so we, we've kind of taken a look, you know, thus far at where we are in, in the state of things from an economic perspective globally and here in the U.S. Uh, we, we, we kind of talked about how policy, you know, drives a lot of these, these regs. 
um, and you know what what uh, it, what effect it's had on on the banks thus far, and how they they're going about solving that. Let's actually kind of take a look for a lot of you folks that aren't familiar with some of the regs um, at the landscape of things, right? So uh, if we take a look at the landscape, the first, the first of the regs that I'd like to mention is an international uh, reg. It's called the Basel. Uh, there are multiple provisions of the Basel, whether it be Basel III, Basel IV, et cetera. Um, what essentially does the Basel, um, uh, or what, what does it mean exactly? Um, you know, it, was, it was started by the Basel Committee. It's a set of international banking regs um, developed by the Bank for International Settlements, um, what essentially does it mean? Uh, when, we, when we break it down, uh, banks must hold more capital now than pre-crisis um, against their assets, right? So um, they have to decrease the size of their balance sheets and, the, and, and overall their ability to leverage themselves. So as I mentioned before, uh, it's, it's tougher for banks to take uh, uh, you know, a more wide array of positions um, because they actually have to have more equity to cover um, and, and uh, actually have um, a living will, kind of, if you will, on how they're going to settle their current positions out there in the market, right? So um, the Basel regs, you know, contain several important changes for banks, uh, capital structures. Um, again, the, the minimum amount of equity um, which was, you know, pre-Basel was around 2%, is now up to 4.5%, uh, and they actually have an additional 2.5% buffer required. So that, that, that raises the equity requirement for most banks out there to 7%. Um, now, a lot of folks say that, you know, this hurts the mid-market mid banks that don't have as much um, or, or as many resources as the top 10 banks out there, or, you know, the big Wall Street banks, um, and, you know, uh, that it, it, it kind of inhibits their growth or their upward mobility in the, uh, in the economy and the state of things. Um, you know, that's kind of the, some of the negative criticism on Basel, if you will. Um, but uh, essentially, it's been created so that that buffer, that 7% now can be used in times of financial stress. Um, so, if you're an economist, if you are a, uh, just generally interested in the state of economics or how the financial markets move, I think we all know that the crisis in 2008 uh, will not be the last. There will be a, another downturn uh, probably within the next few years or so um, that uh, now these regs are in place for to ensure that stability. So the... Uh, you know, there, there's a pros and cons, right, to a lot of these things. Um, what's the overall conclusion of the Basel, at least in my opinion, um, you know, that these regs should result in a somewhat safer financial system, um, while perhaps kind of restraining some future economic growth to a small degree, but, um, you know, it seems to, it seems to be uh, working thus far, especially with some of the stress tests that have been, got, been done on the banking industry here in the U.S. Next, let's uh, let's talk about the big one here, which is oh, what a long name! The Dodd Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Uh, that is shortened or likened to the Dodd Frank Act. Uh, it has to do with uh, with with Christopher Dodd, who was the uh, Senate leader for the uh, banks at, at the current uh, current uh, point in time when uh, the crisis had occurred. Uh, what did the, uh, what did Dodd-Frank do essentially? So, so Dodd-Frank did a number of things. Uh, it created, uh, it created a number of organizations. Um, there's a, there's a council, right. That, that, uh, uh, will, will kind of have that oversight of Dodd-Frank. Uh, it's, it's typically chaired by the treasury secretary. It has nine members in it, which includes the federal reserve, the, uh, the uh, SEC or the Security and Exchange Commission, the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, right, which was created with Dodd Frank, um, and it it also oversees a lot of non bank uh, financial firms, like a lot of hedge funds that are out there. So if any of the banks get too big uh, in the council's determination, they could be regulated by the by the Fed uh, or the Federal Reserve, 
um, which can ask a bank to reserve uh, or to increase its reserve requirement. Um, so the money it's uh, saved up is not, again, being used for lending or for business costs. It's, it's being held to kind of uh, protect um, a lot of the other positions that the bank has had. Um, the Volcker rule was also passed with Dodd-Frank, which is of particular significance um, because it's a part of Dodd-Frank that prohibits banks from owning, investing, or sponsoring hedge funds or private equity funds um, or any proprietary trading operations for their own profit, right? So it, it, uh, it kind of removes uh, that, that, uh, the capability of kind of investing in those non uh, non-banking financial firms. Um, another resultant of Dodd-Frank has been, um, you know, a lot of uh, transparencies that have been created. I mentioned before FINRA, um, which is a, a non-governmental organization that's overseen by the SEC. It kind of acts as a clearinghouse of sorts, uh, which you can kind of think of similarly to a stock exchange. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more transparency to the public. Now trades are being made in the public eye. Um, and a lot, you know, a lot of these derivative type trades that are more risky, um, you, you can kind of see your investments and your equities in a lot of these banks and how they're, they're going about doing those trades. Where in the past, pre-financial crisis, um, you know, you, you really didn't have any insight into that. A lot of things were done behind closed doors. Um, the last thing that's that's to note, I mean, again, I mentioned Dodd Frank is a behemoth. Uh, it's you know a lot of a lot of these policies had you know dates up until 2019 to be enacted, uh, or excuse me, 2012. So a lot of them are enacted, um, but the uh, the the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, was huge, right? So that, that consolidated a number of existing consumer protection responsibilities, um, in other government agencies into one. Um, and why is that important? Well, it created a, uh, a, a sense of how should we, how should we put this, um, liability or a, a responsibility for one organization to kind of oversee the consumers in the market. Um, so what is it meant to do? It's meant to limit kind of what large banks can do uh, in terms of risky lending. Um, I don't know if anyone has tried to go and, uh, and you know, I've recently purchased a home and uh, what, what I'm told is pre-financial collapse or pre-financial crisis, um, the, the lending process was a lot more difficult. Now you need two or, or double or triple uh, triplicates of all of the um, uh, the lending uh, forms, you need to have your W-2 confirmed with the IRS. There are a lot of things that are in place. Um, a lot of the uh, disclosures that banks have to make now uh, were currently not uh, uh, required prior to uh, Dodd-Frank. And the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is kind of the, the organization that, that has to ensure that, you know, these different credit reporting agencies um, even credit and debit cards, um, uh, you know, have these compliance guidelines and these reporting requirements satisfied before any loans are uh, uh, given. Okay, let's talk about CCAR, uh, CCAR, or you know, the Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review Law. Um, it's it's a regulatory framework that was introduced by the Fed. Uh, to kind of assess and regulate and supervise large banks. Um, what essentially does it entail? Uh, it entails stress testing, right? So uh, you do an, a number of calculations um, on your current positions, uh, and, and they, they can come from different disparate sources within, within the bank or different lines of business. Um, and you kind of take a look at things on a macro level and see um, you know, you take a look at the different volatilities and they have, they, they obviously have a, a ton of different calculations that are being done. Um, but, you know, you essentially want to derive whether the bank has sufficient and adequate capital to, uh, to conduct its business um, and that there's capital structure in place um, 
uh, to kind of handle any negative downturns uh, that could potentially happen in the economy. And we'll we'll kind of take a look at a C car uh, architectural slide later, and, and kind of take take a look at how um, a lot of these things can be done better with with in memory computing. Okay, lastly, I know we touched upon the three major ones. Um, you know, you know, I'd be remiss to, to to title this on navigating the the landscape of financial compliance if we weren't to talk about what's to come in the future. Um, and on on June eighth. Um, the House has passed a preliminary bill, which is called the Financial Choice Act. Okay, so what is why? Why is that important? Um, there is going to be an uh, you know an independent bureau now, um, which would be kind of uh, reconstituted now as an executive branch agency um, called the Consumer Law Enforcement Agency. Uh, the new bill will would eliminate or reduce the oversight authority. Um, uh, on a lot of these different types of lending uh, instruments that are out there. Uh, additionally, the president now would have the power to replace the head of the agency at will. Um, so, so now they kind of want to roll this up into the government instead of having uh, kind of NGOs that are over, overseen by the SEC. So they want to roll back some of these Dodd-Frank related structural um, implementations that they've had. Um, What's another thing that's important by the Financial Choice Act? Well, commercial banks would no longer be subjected to uh, prohibitions on speculative for-profit trading. So recall I mentioned that Volcker rule. Well, that would go out the door, right? Um, so uh, you know, you know, you can you can potentially take a look at uh, you know ownership of of hedge hedge funds and private equity funds that are out there um, that uh, would now have reinvestment potentially from some of the big banks. Um, so another thing that's that's uh, kind of interesting to me is that it would roll back the f fiduciary duty rule. So the fiduciary duty rule essentially um, is a rule that's uh, enacted uh, or overseen by by FINRA, uh, which essentially states that investment brokers would now not be required to prioritize their clients' best interests when advising on retirement. Right. So. Um, you know, they, they could potentially, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I really personally, from my perspective, don't see what the, what the value is of, of rolling that back. But again, I'm here to kind of state the facts and, and where they're expecting things to go. Um, the last thing that's pretty interesting and that I really actually like, right, is uh, creation of an off-ramp. So, um, what they're proposing is that if banks hold at least 10% of their assets liquid um, or in capital, they would be largely exempted from a lot of Dodd-Frank's heightened requirements, regardless of their size, right? So this would help a lot of the smaller and mid-market types of banks out there um, that are kind of getting strangled a bit by the Dodd-Frank regs. Um, and I think it's it's pretty interesting as well because it goes uh, it goes to 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 see a lot of you know that, that instability again. Basel requires you know seven percent equity. Um, you know ten percent should be well enough to cover uh, any uh, any downturns and you know to to mitigate a, a default that uh, plagued us during the crisis, right? Um, so so this is kind of this, the future of where things are going. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the key uh, technological trends um, now. And you know why is this important to us? Well. Um, you know, the, the key technological trends kind of uh, lead way or kind of give you a, a view into where uh, financial compliance could be going, right? Um, so I just, I have a couple here. I'm going to kind of talk through them quickly. Um, you know, fintech firms are now being considered as partners, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the head of Wells Fargo and a lot of the other uh, large organizations, they want to collaborate with fintechs. Um, because they want to kind of expand their scope. They want to get closer in, uh, to their customers. And that's really kind of what fintech is driving nowadays. Um, you know, deriving some better reporting insights. Uh, they, they also uh, drive more innovation than kind of a lot of these uh, bigger banks, right? Moving to the next one. Um, this one's really, really important. Uh, banks are using open APIs to monetize their digital assets and data. So the wave of 
um, open source and, and, and these open APIs really now is touching into financial services a lot more. We tend to see it a ton um, where open APIs kind of enable banks to integrate their products and services with any third party applications that they have. So it kind of brings all of their infrastructure together and allows uh, reporting, you know, across all of these different uh, disparate data sources, right? Um, so it's, it's really, really positive stuff. Um, the next one is mobile banking. I mean, you know, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this one. I think we all know that every, everyone has a smartphone for the most part now. Over 95% of the world now has cellular coverage. Um, so, you know, this increased, uh, per, you know, uh, kind of move towards fintech leaves consumers with, uh, you know, that increased need for the services at their fingertips. Um, so going mobile is very pervasive now. Um, banking as a platform is a new trend that we're seeing here. Uh, again, this is kind of, you know, um, reported by uh, by Capgemini, one of the biggest, and Gartner, one of the, the, the big um, uh, uh, institutions out there, uh, they're a big consulting firm. Um, they kind of see banking as a platform as kind of a shift now. Um, and they, they see it now with that capability of that API layer or that application programming interface that I just mentioned before, that they can kind of bring their different business units together um, as a total banking platform, right? And we certainly see that here at GridGain with a lot of our customers. Uh, that want to front load and, and, and offer uh, services as a whole instead of having disparate, uh, you know, kind of uh, hodgepodge solutions out there. Public clouds. Public clouds are all the rage now. Um, banks are all moving to public clouds. Um, you know, there are perceived security and regulatory risks that are out there. I think a lot of banks and organizations see that um, they have been addressed a lot, especially by a lot of these big uh, providers like you know your Googles and your Amazons out there and your Microsofts, um, they certainly have uh, heated a lot of the uh, financial industry's um, uh, requests for security and regulatory risks, um, and they kind of built them into the platform. So we're seeing a lot more adoption of public clouds out there. AI, or uh, what we can affect affectionately call uh, machine learning. Um, you know, you can see, uh, you know, next generation uh, AI models being developed out there. I know that we see Watson's out there. Um, you know, Watson is currently being used uh, as a means of financial compliance um, and to kind of use its its learning mechanisms as a means of, uh, you know, kind of fine tuning a lot of the, the calculations and the models that they have out there. Um, I, I think we're only going to see this grow in the future. Okay, so you know this is the last one I'll talk about before we kind of talk about grid computing, but blockchain, I'd be remiss to not talk about how it's really pervasive in, in the financial industry. Um, you know, banks are increasingly willing to kind of dis explore this distributed ledger technology, uh, which is essentially a, a peer to peer basis. I mean, I can talk about blockchain forever because it seems to be the new standard for a lot of the cryptocurrencies that are out there. Um, and it's really, really interesting technology. But um, if you don't know about blockchain, definitely check it out. Um, it's it's definitely uh, a, a pervasive technology in today's uh, financial landscape. Okay, let's get into the fun stuff, which is um, grids and in-memory computing, right? So um, this is kind of the last type of um, uh, financial uh, or, or, or trend that we see now. Um, and, you know, what's the purpose of it? Well, um, you know, disk traditionally is too slow to do any type of trading, to do any type of process eventing, um, event related reporting, compliance calculations. Um, so, you know, anytime you have to uh, introduce IO or, you know, any type of input output, whether it be going to your database to grab data, going to, um, you know, uh, through the network to grab any type of data, you're going to see um, performance hits. Um, that's really where in-memory computing has grown. I think we've seen, uh, you know, uh, we're project Gartner's projecting by 2019 it to be a uh, close to uh, I think it's a 19 billion dollar market. I think I have that. We'll take a look at that though. 
Well, let's take a look at a quick use case before we hop into grid computing. So you can see here kind of, uh, you know, a C car um, model. And again, you know, what's the important thing to note here? Um, you know, you have your integration from your disk or your different lines of businesses, whether they be disparate data sources, um, they typically would pump them into some sort of a data warehouse. Um, and from there, um, you know, a data warehouse then ships that data to a calculation engine where simulations are run on it. And then it's shipped back to your data warehouse to be served up to your reporting system, right? Um, so this is a pretty stable standard type of implementation. Um, and I want you guys to keep this in mind because in a few minutes, we're going to kind of talk about how this can kind of be remodeled um, to implement it with a grid um, and how that would really benefit the performance and the scalability of a lot of these financial compliance related um, operations. So, but first, before we do all that, let's take a deeper look at uh, grid computing. Um, you know, you know, first question we need to ask ourselves is why in memory computing important for financial compliance? Um, the answer to that is simply an acronym, HTAP, or hybrid transactional or analytical processing, right? So what does that mean? Uh, it gives you the capability to um, not only have uh, real-time data, um, but also to be able to compute on that data at any given point in time. Um, you know, Gartner just here in February has kind of, uh, you know, denoted that HTAP can have transformational impact on business. Um, I'm sure that you folks hear about Gartner all the time and how they're, um, you know, a large research, research organization. Um, if you're not familiar with them, um, you know, they're one of the leaders in the market out there for market research. Um, and, you know, they tend to be, uh, you know, Kind of the oracles out there when you when you look at uh, where technology is moving and, and uh, HTAP in this case is really really uh, interesting technology and uh, it, it kind of mitigates a lot of the uh, performance hits that you typically see in the past right so we see value in being able to run computations on data where it resides so why in memory now well it's basic speed, scale, and real-time insights, right? Um, you know, digital transformation, a lot of big banks are now moving towards that. I mean, we talked about their partnerships with fintechs in the past. We talked about how things are moving in that direction. Um, you know, in-memory gives you kind of the capability to, um, to, to kind of do things real-time um, and to kind of have those insights on a lot of these, those different positions that you have. Um, you know, so I, I think we've seen in the past, you know, uh, the important thing to to talk about here, I, I said 19 billion before, it was actually 10 billion, the in-memory computing market. Uh, that's what Gartner expects by 2019. What does that mean? That folks are dumping a ton of money into in-memory computing or platforms, if you will. Um, you know, my experience in, profession, in, uh, in, in financial services is that we have a ton of customers that have a number of different use cases um, that kind of satisfy that and uh, you know financial compliance tends to be that uh, you know fall into that realm as well i mean if, if we can talk about moving a hundred times faster i think we all know that uh, within financial compliance time is money right okay so what's an in-memory data platform um, so again you have your data grid that i've been mentioning you have the capability of of running computations of running services of streaming data, of having event-based messaging, um, you know, having a full file system in memory, uh, having the resiliency and the, the clustering capabilities. Uh, we'll talk about that more on the next slide. But again, what's the what are the benefits? Uh, you can have uh, transactional integrity. Uh, you know the scalability. Again, the high availability of utilizing a distributed system. Um, I'll kind of give you a better idea of that here in the next slide um, when we kind of take a look at what this in-memory uh, uh, platform looks like here. Um, but you can think of it this way, right? Um, you have the capability of streaming data, uh, whether it be structured or unstructured data or um, data that's coming from Hadoop, or, you know, you're running your analytics or BI 
uh, or business intelligence related OLAP functions on um, or, you know, from your data lake, if you will. Um, and, you know, it, it supports a number of different applications. So again, that's the, that's the value again, if we, we touch back on how, you know, one of the key trends are we're mo moving towards open APIs, um, you know, and the open source movement, I think there's a lot of interest now in grid technology, specifically grid technology that has that open source uh, backing behind it, right? So, I mean, this is just kind of an example of some of the financial customer use cases that I've uh, uh, faced here at GridGain. Uh, and again, you know, we, we kind of uh, are, are backed by the Apache Foundation and, you know, the, the product, in, uh, the non-enterprise product, which is Apache Ignite, right? Um, but, you know, you can see trading platforms, the, the risk-related management, um, the different analytics that you can do. And of course, compliance and, and monitoring, right? So whether it be fraud, uh, we're currently working with a company now in POC that's that's kind of looking to do some some uh, reconciliation related fraud work, uh, whether it be the uh, the anti money laundering or the, the know your customer related uh, guidelines or principles, um, and you have to check you know uh, different disparate data sources uh, to to kind of match things up. Um, you know, all of that is being used kind of now with that high velocity, um, high volume of data, um, that real time performance that you're expecting from grid technology. And I think that's what's really uh, interesting to a lot of folks nowadays. Um, so, you know, we can kind of just take a look at some of the capabilities that you'd have from performance. Again, this isn't a financial compliance use case per se. Um, but again, the important thing to notice is that, you know, one of our customers, uh, Spurbank, which are, is the largest bank in Russia and Eastern Europe and the third largest in Europe uh, as well, has kind of front loaded all of their banking capabilities. So recall again, back to that key trend of banking as a platform, they've used us as banking as a platform um, where uh, compliance is certainly just one facet of the many uh, uh, different services that they offer within the platform itself. Um, yeah, a lot of that is white noise to a lot of you folks. What's important? One billion transactions per second. And that's based on 10 commodity servers and one terabyte of RAM. Um, so roughly, you know, a 25K setup, um, one billion transactions, a 25K setup. Now even small businesses have the capability to scale up to a billion transactions per second. Um, so, you know, it's really, really interesting um, in financial services because a lot of folks are looking for that type of speed. Um, but, uh, you know, the capabilities are really endless with what you can do. Um, so lastly, uh, as, I, as I wrap up here, I want you to recall that, uh, that, that C-CAR related, uh, 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 and I'll, I'll just scroll back to it here for a second, uh, this slide here on, this, on the architecture of C-CAR and how it's traditionally done. Um, again, what I'm going to show you now is kind of uh, just an example of how you can streamline um, or revisit that type of architecture utilizing Apache Ignite, right? Um, and, you know, we can see some of the, the, the advantages right off the bat. If any of you folks are technical, um, you have, again, streaming APIs that are available to you. So no longer do you have to batch out these large jobs you know, end of day or these end of day processes to get them into your data layer or what was previously a data warehouse, right? Um, you can do that all in real time now, right? And you can have consistency in, in your data sets, um, which is particularly useful when you take a look here at the top and you're doing any type of ad hoc reporting. Um, ad hoc reporting isn't as valuable when you're looking at stale data, right? So um, the capability of streaming or kind of front loading an in-memory data grid in front of a lot of these different business units, whether it be you know core banking, your treasury uh, positions, or you know other subsidiaries that you have uh, within the large banks, um, streaming them into the grid um, is as good of a use case as I've seen, and a lot of our customers do kind of leverage that, whether it be with Kafka or any of these other messaging buses that they have out there. Um, you have the, the capabilities now of running those calculations directly where the data is located, right? So um, that's particularly useful. 
specifically um, because, you know, you get, will have increased performance. So recall in the previous CCAR architectural, architectural diagram that we were looking at, you kind of had to ship data out for calculations to be run and then those new positions to be sent back into your data warehouse. Um, now you can simul simultaneously run them and kind of have different separate caches for your different scenarios um, in, a, in a time series format. So, um, you know, why is this important? You can run calcs in real time or near real, or near real time and it'll help, uh, you know, a, a big bank to kind of understand their different compliance positions faster and how it can leverage itself um, uh, to stay within a certain equity limit to meet those different compliance uh, regs. Um, again, you still have your reporting layer, um, but um, you know if you go with uh, or decide to to kind of look into Apache Ignite, the one thing I'll tell you is that we have SQL capabilities, right? So if you are running ad hoc reporting from your reporting mart or from any type of uh, application layer that you're uh, visualizing the data from, um, it would sure, certainly be nice to use a query interface that a majority of the world knows, which is in this case SQL, right? Um, so again. Uh, the key takeaways, we've eliminated the, the need for, for that data warehouse um, to send and receive information from calculation engines. Um, but, you know, again, the beauty of kind of using grid technology, uh, specifically, uh, you know, Apache Ignite or, you know, grid gain in this case, um, is that you can plug and play wherever you need speed. Um, you don't have to deprecate your previous uh, types of uh, technologies that you have. You don't have to rip and replace anything. You can leverage uh, grid technology, which again, which again is kind of a trend that we're seeing a lot of organizations use now um, to uh, achieve a lot of your financial compliance related goals, right? So again, um, you know, uh, if anyone is interested or wants to know more, um, you know, you'll certainly be receiving this uh, presentation. And you'll have, uh, you know, the capability to take a look at either GridGain, which is, offers an enterprise version of a computing uh, grid platform, or, or Apache Ignite in that case, which is our open source version. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for, for being attentive for this long, and uh, I'd like to entertain any questions. Hi, Fody. Okay. Um, there are no questions at the moment, and... We'll give people a second or two. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, let's see here. And we're at the top of the hour anyhow. So um, what I will do is I'll close the webinar for this, this particular session. And I wanted to thank the audience for attending. And Fodi, thank you for a great job. This is very, very interesting. And I think that there's a lot of valuable information here. Um, so with that said, I invite everyone to attend a future webinar. Our schedule is posted on gridgain.com. And Fodi, thank you again for your time today. Thanks a lot. I appreciate everyone's attentiveness. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>